Dr. Shaw, it is really good to see you. And thank, uh, you. thank you for uh, giving us some time today. My pleasure. Now, uh, Dr. Shaw, you are uh, one of our faculty who's come from, you know, uh, various uh, places where you've gotten your education and training and, and, uh, and, and, and really impressive resume of, of, of things you've done in terms of education training and, and also what you've done in, you know, clinically and what you're doing in research. So it's impressive to me all the, um, that so many of our faculty have taken these journeys, but um, I, I'd like people to understand where the motivations come from, why you um, made a decision somewhere along your path to say, I wanna get into medicine. And I want to not just get into medicine, but I want to really pursue academia and, and really trying to make an impact and changing care for people in the future. I think the, the interest in science started a long time ago when I was a child. Um, I was always interested in how things work. And uh, when I was in grade two or three, we had um, a field trip to a local place where I was only one more interested in gathering local plants when other people are, you know, having fun over there. So science actually started a long time uh, uh, since the time I remember. And that science uh, of how things work, I think, extended into when I started into grade 11, where I am from, you have to choose either pre-medical side or pre-engineering side. So I chose pre-medical side because the discovery in biology to me was more attractive than discovery in other specialties at that time. Uh, I was um, good at math, physics, and biology, all of them. So I chose biology at that time, went to medical school. And in medical school, it was quite obvious that this is the decision I should have taken, and I did take correctly. After medical school, and actually uh, during the fourth year of medical school, um, I was doing ophthalmology rotation, which was mandatory at that time. And honestly, I was very impressed by the argon laser when I saw someone in the room uh, lasering an eye with uh, diabetic retinopathy. I thought, you know what, this is something I want to do as well. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, and then further extra work in ophthalmology at that time, both in hospital and also in the field, um, I prompted me to choose ophthalmology as a career from there, I came to United States for my electives, which also did an ophthalmology at John Hopkins and worked with Dr. Peter Campicharo, uh, who's world foremost expert in retinal angiogenesis. Um, stayed along with him for a few years after that, was involved in the pioneering research, which has led to the treatment for macular degeneration, as well as retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy and venetlusion all the anti-VEGF we hear about, the injections, much of the pioneering research I was involved in with Dr. Peter Campicharo and his group. They were very interesting times. Later on, I went for residency in ophthalmology at David and Ali Islam Eye Institute in Rochester, New York. After residency, came back to Hopkins for a fellowship. During the fellowship, I realized that I have done enough work on macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, as well as vein inclusion not that I'll stop working on it, I kind of shifted my gears towards retinal degenerations, genetic retinal degeneration, which is retinitis pigmentosa and Stargardt disease. So after my fellowship, I stayed on at Johns Hopkins for a few years, focused on that. So the transition from uh, being very much into science, trying to know how things work, to doing research in how we can treat macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and inclusion, all the way on to now focused on how we can treat the diseases which people call orphan diseases in which there is no treatment. And uh, unfortunately, you will notice that there's a big investment of big pharma in uh, diseases like macular degeneration, retinopathy, because it's more common, more prevalent, but these rare diseases don't get that much of an impact from the private funding or big pharmaceutical funding. Some, some of that is changing now. So I think there's a more need. That's the need we have to focus on. And we also have to keep in mind that if you understand that the number of life years affected by a genetic retinal disease are way more than someone at 70 who gets macular degeneration, 
absolutely not saying one should get macular degeneration, but if you look at a four years old or 10 years old kid who starts to lose vision at 10 years, he has a lot of life left in front of him. And if you're able to somehow treat them at that stage, their number of years, which are productive, part of the society, have a huge impact. And that's exactly the, the, the diseases which are ignored, have been ignored in the past, not anymore with the gene therapy and stem cell and so on and so forth coming along. So shifted gears towards that. Another uh, thing which I always noticed was that I am from uh, Pakistan. And when I went back to Pakistan every year to see my parents, oftentimes people would come to me thinking that since I'm in United States, I may have access to these new things and new uh, treatments. And many of them had genetic retinal diseases, retinitis pigmentosa, very common, consanguineous marriages over there. So when they asked me for a treatment, I realized there is not even a treatment in the US for it, let alone somewhere else. And that also cemented my focus on that. I've done plenty of clinical trials. I've been involved in close to 100 clinical trials in the past. And I thought, you know what? Now is the time to focus on diseases which not many people are focused on. And that my journey towards retinal degenerations. Um, uh, and along with that, I also developed interest in delivery of healthcare in low resource settings. And low resource could be Western Pennsylvania they could be Nepal, they could be anywhere in Europe where uh, there are less access to physicians and ophthalmologists. And that led me to be interested in big data analytics to see how we are providing care, how we are delivering care, uh, which people have access to it and not access to it and giving them easier access decreases the morbidity or the impact on their vision. So this kind of research I got involved in as well, also because I'm from a uh, part of the world which is less developed and there's a big need for that uh, there as well. And my third interest, uh, which developed over time was uh, drug toxicity in the eye, which sometimes mimics genetic retinal diseases as well. So essentially, I did a lot of work on hydroxychloroquine toxicity. Hydroxychloroquine is now, everyone knows about it because of COVID, right. Plaquenil is being used, but it's used for lupus uh, and it has shown to reduce mortality and morbidity in lupus patients. One of the untoward side effects is on the vision and screening, early screening detection is very important. So I started working on that and uh, eventually developed interest in a lot of uh, drug related ocular toxicities, which actually tie into pharmacogenomics to see which kind of genetic makeup in people would make them more susceptible to the untoward effect of these drugs, or on the other hand, make them more susceptible to treatment effect of some drugs. So all this ties it, it ties into the, the retina per se and how retina gets affected by our environment, by our genes, and by what we add to ourselves later, for example, uh, medications. Wow, you, you really touched on a lot of really interesting aspects of what you're doing in your research. Obviously, I, I, I you know, um, I agree with you that the orphan, you know, uh, conditions that we refer to, you know, really, really do not receive enough support and, and, and attention. And, and I, I think that you uh, phrased that very well, that, you know, it is often those inherited conditions people have for a long period of their life. And, and, um, and certainly, you know, I, we have a lot of people doing work as you are in this area. And you as a retina specialist, you must um, obviously, it, it, you realize that it's not so orphaned. There's a lot of people that, that, that will find you and come to you because of these, these conditions. And they are very, unfortunately, uh, very, uh, you know, um, they're very blinding. So, um, so that's, so with all these things that you're working on from the, the, the gene therapy and the gene delivery type of, of, or, or, or things that, that all the, the team here is working on. And then, um, and then you, you mentioned the big data and the analytics, which I think is very fascinating, particularly as you're relating it to the way that we can use that kind of technology to really provide better access. I think that's also something that's very in, you know, uh, encouraging and, and, and very innovative. Yes. Where do you feel that, um, that, that uh, you know, that we may be with some of these technologies and some of these, these new treatments in these conditions 
in the in the coming years, if we were to if we were to um, let our, our patients know what what we uh, what we uh, may be able to see in the next uh, you know five years or so. I think uh, our department under the leadership of Dr. Sahil has expanded and grown significantly to encompass most of the diseases where there's an unmet need. And this is one of those. And we are actually, I'm a PI on uh, a gene therapy trial for retinitis pigmentosa. And we are actively recruiting patients who have X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, but that's just the beginning. As we move forward, more and more types of genetic diseases of the retina will have gene therapies available. And we are in the process of some other uh, gene therapy uh, treatments for different diseases. But right now, we actively have enrollment for X-linked retina stigmatosa. Second thing comes is stem cell research, in which you are able to put stem cells into the retina and have those stem cells give the patient some visual perception. I'm not going to say visual ability yet, but we will eventually get there. So those are also very actively ongoing. But in the near term, in the near future, gene therapy shows the most promise. And we are actively doing and involved in the research which leads to gene therapy. Our department also has a lab which is creating new viral vectors which are safer, more efficacious in delivery of the correct genes into the retina. That's the, the part. And then there are medical treatments as well, for example, neuroprotection, how to protect the remaining cells of the retina. Along the neuroprotection, we are also involved in both basic sciences and uh, somewhat early clinical research on trying to see if there's some antioxidants which have better penetration into the retina. Are there any other oxidative uh, mechanisms which we can target in order to reduce. So my also research is focused on uh, how to use antioxidant and see if they have any neuroprotective effect. Unfortunately, most of the past attempts on using antioxidant for neuroprotection have failed, but there is still promise because there are newer compounds, which are modified form of older compounds, which have better penetration into the cells. And once they go into the cells, they're able to provide that protection to them. So neuroprotection is another uh, area where for people who do not have gene therapy available, who do not qualify for stem cell treatment, they may be able to protect the cells over a longer period of time using some neuroprotective compounds. So we're also working on that. Uh, when I came here, um, there were very few clinical trials, but now we have expanded to a significant number of clinical trials, which, which covers Stargardt disease, retinitis pigmentosa, um, and we even have uh, macular degeneration um, uh, clinical trials, which are the newer one, the promising one ongoing. So we have really built a very strong team here, here under Dr. Sahil's leadership, which is now establishing more and more and more clinical research and basic science research and bridging the gap between them to offer our patients new and novel treatments. Um, and I think we have very strong hope that in the next decade or so, we would have achieved significant milestones in order to be able to offer our patients treatment for which there was none existed until yesterday. That's certainly very encouraging. And, and it's wonderful to hear that you and, and, you know, you're um, one of the faculty that was brought on after Dr. Sal came, and, and so you were here to kind of see some of that growth, and, and I can attest to the fact, since I was here before as well, before Dr. Sal came, that, that in the retina, um, in terms of research that we've uh, seen in these last few years, we've really, really expanded in, on the, the basic science side and, and what's going on to develop translation research, but as you mentioned, an awful lot of clinical research, and it's really encouraging. Um, and it's certainly, you know, a credit to what Dr. Sal's done. But I'm very uh, um, pleased to see this for for our new faculty that are coming and getting a chance to to really work in this and see it grow. Right. So, um, so for all of us, we want to see uh, one Pittsburgh play a role, and 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 the the team here at the University of Pittsburgh play a role. Um, and you mentioned, you know, where you came from, Johns Hopkins you know, obviously still a premier institution. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, um, I, I, 
I won't, I won't ask you to say, but I do think that, that we're heading in a direction where we'll be providing, um, you know, uh, answers at the level that those institutions are and collaborating with those institutions as we always have and really providing, you know, that kind of care um, and, and hope for people who have that type of, of uh, vision loss. So I think I agree with you completely. And I think part of the reason for me to move from there to here was Dr. Sahil when he joined here. I had discussions with him and I saw his vision, how he wanted to transform Pittsburgh into the next generation hub for treatment of all kinds of diseases with special focus on genetic retinal diseases. And this was a opportunity I recall I had two decades ago when I joined Peter Campicharo, Dr. Peter Campicharo's team in which I was part of the pioneering research on anti-VGF or the injections with most people with macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy get. I think this is another place where the, the inherited retinal degenerations and of course other diseases as well are gonna uh, be top notch and uh, top of the world, uh, state of the art research going on and so on and so forth. So I think that's, uh, I'm very hopeful and I'm very optimistic that we will be the hub for people to reach out to us for treatments of diseases which are not available elsewhere. Well, and that's exciting to hear, and I and I'm um, so glad that you uh, joined this team to do so, and and you know what what great skills you bring to it. So, thank you so very much, thank um, and thank you for spending time to share this with our our um, our audience and thank you and the people that uh, that are um, again care and support what we're trying to do here at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you very you much. You have a great day. Thank. You.